Okay, Filippo, thank you very much for this beautiful lecture, as always, entertaining, informative, and knowledgeable, and everything. Uh, I will not turn on my camera because I've been told that the connection is not good, so uh, so that the audio is uh, on. We have 10 more minutes for questions, and uh, I will now I will read some of the questions that have been asked. Uh, so, first Question number one, Filippo. What do you think of alloplastic materials such as beta TCP and intrabony defects? Well, there has been some data and uh, some interesting. The problem with the alloplastic is uh, there are various problems, but I, I would like to stress that the the data from Luigi Nibali and, and Francesco Cairo and, and their group that actually is the basis of the recent guidelines, it's on. Uh, on JCP and it's open access. You you might want to read it surely. And an intrabony nowadays, we the technique of choices are uh, uh, membranes or amelogenins or uh, xenogen with uh, with uh, amelogenins. So we would say that alloplastic materials are not the first choice, and that beta TCP. I, I would not consider, consider it. Surely I would not consider it as a first choice, but mainly for one reason because the resort. And and in some defects, resorption is really not the, the thing you want to achieve. You you sometimes want to have material to sustain the wound over time. So you accept actually some biocompatibility over time and having maybe some materials that stays there more than something yeah. that resorts. Plus resorption is always associated with inflammation. So I don't know. I don't really have very robust okay. feeling. Okay. The question, second question is, can you say something about how you suture in the papilla preservation flaps? Well, the, the suture... Laurels... Sorry? Like like the Laurel suturing technique according to Laurel and and, and what, what do you prefer in, when you do the papilla preservation suturing? Well, you have to bear in mind that uh, Lars Laurel has been our mentor from 2000 to 2004. So whatever I do clinically has been taught by him, mainly, and by Maurizio Tonetti, that were my two mentors. So uh, the the Lars Laurel suture, which is an horizontal, a vertical uh, modified mattress suture, is surely the technique of choice. In case I would use uh, uh, also a, a membrane, or when I would use Membrane, most probably I would also make a uh, two-layer techniques, which is an horizontal crossed mattress suture that allows me to keep up the flap and most probably keep the membrane just in place. And then on top of a, a laurel suture, whereas if I do grafting with the melogenins, it's just a laurel suture. Okay. One of the questions is always the question of debate. Do we raise the palatal flap or not? Uh, when would you actually raise the palatal flap? What is the indication of raising the palatal flap? Well, when the defect is mainly, in fact, on the mid-palatal portion, in a you know, or up to the apex on the palatal area, when it's extended palatally, then I would surely open palatally. But bear in mind that I think I showed, even in the apical involved teeth, that from the buccal, you achieve everything on the root on the root surface. In fact, the tricky bit is the treatment of the most coronal part of the defect, not the apical, because the deeper the defect is, the thinner is the root, and the easier it is to access the defect from the buccal. But the, as a rule of thumb, surely if a defect is mainly confined in the, in the interdental area, I can easily treat it from buccal, even in molars. You might want to compensate, and I do sometimes, with maybe a non-surgical side from the palatal side and the open access uh, access from under the papilla from the buccal side. Uh, this is something I, I have to say I often do. But I raise less and less uh, palatal flaps, I have to say. And I cannot notice, and the evidence is pretty clear to support it, a dramatic difference. But I think the important is the concept of the surgery. Because if you approach yourself as I do a surgery on an area, it's one thing. But if you divide the area in papillas and defects, of intrabony defects, then it's completely different. So what I'm saying is that the surgery, the way I see it nowadays, is just a, a, an addition of 
little different type of surgical intervention that goes from one papilla to another. So you might want to be minimally invasive on one papilla and then being opening the next papilla, so according to the type of defect. But of course, if you want yourself just to be, for example, resective, then you need to think at the area site and not at the defect site. And therefore, you have to open the papilla, the, the, the palatal side. Okay. Uh, there are a lot of questions, but okay, there, there, there are a lot of questions, but I, I will choose some of the some of the maybe more trickier ones. One of them is on the soft tissue quality, the keratinization of the wet. So, if we have a lack of keratinized tissue, is there a different approach, or we do still same, or do we go maybe with as in that case with a deep intrabony defect, do we compensate that with a connective tissue graft at the same time as we do uh, regenerative or reconstructive surgery? What is what is your opinion on that? Well, I would say that uh, after the evidence from Leo, Leo really clearly showed that the thickness of the tissue uh, has an impact not very much on, on the clinical attachment gain of the wound, but surely on the stability of, of the gingival margin. Uh, and uh, um, the, um, therefore, I would say that most probably, if I wouldn't have, for example, I'm thinking about the, the classical area is the lower premolars, right? Uh, on the fourth, on the fifth, where you can have very little uh, keratinized tissue well, to be honest with you, I don't think it's creatinized tissue that would drive, I'm, I'm always thinking, it's not the creatinized tissue that would force me to pull a graft or not, but it's actually the, the, the phenotype of the patient. I think phenotype, maybe in an anterior area, it's something where I would like to put also uh, under the flap a grafting, but a thin one, to increase thickness and therefore to give more soft tissue stability. But I wouldn't very much concerned about the height of the creatinized tissue, but the thickness of the soft tissue in total. Okay. Uh, now we, we we have this one question. It is often uh, things are often used, and it's about lasers. That some colleagues show that with laser use uh, that they can treat most of their cases without any surgical intervention. So what is the opinion or the stand on, on laser and what is your opinion on that, that maybe w with the additional use of lasers that there is, uh, although we know there is no evidence to support this, but people always ask the same question. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm very, it's very easy here. And I would like to uh, use the sentence of Charlie Cobb in a, in a magnificent paper. Uh, in Periodontology 2000, in 2008, the, the title of, of the paper, if I remember correctly, is The Use of Lasers in Periodontal Treatment, The Essence and the Noise. That's, I think, the title. But it's a beautiful paper. Basically, he, he concludes the, the paper by saying, after 30 years of clinical studies, under the 18 clinical trial, we still don't know whether it makes any sense or not to add lasers in the bright room. Okay. Now, uh, but I want to be clear. I think one story is to talk about teeth, another story about talking about implants, because you see, we tend to get, as dentists, we get, we get fascinated by tools because we like to play with our hands. But I think, once again, what is important is the biological approach. What is the goal? The goal of the treatment in a root is to debride, to scale, and to root plane. Um, at least this is what you can do. But on implant, you can't do implant planing, and the scaling is very poor. Therefore, on implant, you would potentiate uh, the debridement phase. Therefore, maybe on the implant, there might be something interesting or something that would be conducive. But the evidence, to be honest, to me, is just suggesting that it doesn't add much, but it costs a lot of money. OK. Uh, another question, which is uh, also an issue always, how long do you wait following non-surgical therapy to do surgical treatment? I wait three do months. Do six, six weeks or three months or six months? What? I, I do three months. Uh, of course, you have to bear in mind that 10 years ago, 15 years ago, I was doing more and more surgery compared to, to now because I was reevaluating at one month and I was treating also pockets of four millimeters bleeding. So, of course, every patient was undergoing surgery. 
Now I wait three months. And in the paper that I also contributed of Jean Suvan, Jan Derex, and Cristiano Tomasi, it is clearly written that the, the wound keeps on healing. If you would assess six months down the road, the healing would be even higher. However, I don't wait that long because in, in this chronic treatment, there is a momentum. Uh, so by waiting too long between reevaluation, between treatment, might be sometimes a bit too much then to justify surgery. So I normally wait three months, then re-evaluation. Re if there is a chance for a second session of non-surgical treatment, I do not hesitate. I do provide non-surgical treatment again, because that's what I would like to have if I would be a patient, to be honest. But if there, there are indications that the defects are associated with inflammation and forcation, I would go for surgery and I would try to be regenerative. Okay, now just to continue to that last sentence, there's a question. Uh, could you repeat the indications for avoiding a second course of non-surgical therapy? So when would you do a non-surgical therapy again, or when would you and when would you go after directly to the surgical part to clarify this? Yes, yes, thank you. Uh, if I might, I'm um, speaking to the colleague that made the question. It's not that we try to avoid the non -sec the second non-surgical treatment because it looks like we, that we want to cut people. It's not that we, we aim to do the surgery. I know we've always been there. It's more fun, let's face it. But it's not the point of the treatment. The, the, the point is when you should see the surgery, the, the place where you know the non-surgical treatment is not working. So we know that non-surgical treatment is effective then on shallow pockets, so our residual pockets of five, maybe up to six, on an anterior area on supraboni defects. When you have these components, then you might want to attempt a second non-surgical treatment. But always remember the patient. If the patient is smoker, usually the second session of non-surgical treatment will be even less efficacious. Okay. So all the rest would go for surgeries. Uh, let's see another question. Uh, uh, Okay, uh, do you do elective root canal treatment for defects extending the apex? This is always a question, to do root canal treatment or not. When do we think that the pulp will go into necrosis and then have problems? So, well, we know we should not do root canal treatment as a preventive measures because most of the teas still, say, still stay vital, but what is your opinion and how do you approach this? I, I think it's a very tricky question. So for example, there are various approaches. What, what I, I showed two cases. You know, one was treated already, in, and when they're treated, I do also this kind of very minor lapisectomy. You might have seen there was a sort of a bevel on the apex, which I, I, I mean, I'm really not good in that, so I'm, I'm not capable to tell you what is the degree of beveling on the apex. But but I, I normally take the birds. And I'm trying to bevel it up a little the apex when the defect is getting to the apex. I have to confess, if the tooth is vital before the surgery and I don't visually or uh, examine the, the apex involvement, I try not to uh, do endo treatment. But this sometimes you know, got me wrong. For example, a case, uh, the case that we, we in fact saw the case because I showed it as an example of a periodontal surgery in periodontitis patient on a incisors that had a lower incisor that had hopeless prognosis, the, I, the vitality and the granuloma appeared four years after surgery. That means that when you do this type of surgery, you have to keep following up your patient throughout time. So you might decide at the end, of course, if you don't invade the apex, not to do it, but you have to have the organization to do it and a patient that is compliant because eventually if you don't do it you might end up with some endo problems okay Filippo, thank you for for this unfortunately this is the last question we can answer and uh, uh, because we're out of time uh, so uh, i would like to thank Filippo again for his wonderful webinar and for his answers uh, and I'd like to uh, invite you all for the next webinar in two weeks, or oh, actually not in two weeks, and, and in seven days on Thursday, which will be Virginie Montecorti, and she will talk about improving smile aesthetics with periodontal plastic surgery. 
And uh, I invite you all to follow us on our social media platforms, such as the Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, and etc. So from all of us from the EFP, I bid you farewell and looking forward to seeing you next time. Filippo, bye again. Bye, ciao. And uh, bye bye to everybody here from the globe uh, listening to us from the EFP. Thank you very much, everybody.